Philly.net. Uh, this is our uh, February monthly meeting, and uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, I'm Bill Wolf, and I've been doing this for I don't know how many decades. I lost count. Um, we have a pretty good uh, sized crowd tonight, and uh, we have uh, two speakers one for Microsoft, and he's going to talk about data science. Really cool stuff. You'll like that talk. And then uh, the second hour, uh, Stasha Kurek is going to talk about F-sharp and Fable. F-sharp, of course, functional programming. So we're really going to make you think tonight. But before we do that, I'm in love with curling. So I want everybody to cheer with me. You ready? I'm going to say it three times. So I'm going to say yip three times, and then you have to yell sweep. Ready? Yip, yip, yip. Three, three times. Count. Three times. Try to do it again. Yip, yip, yip. That's it. Okay, excellent. Good job. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That was last, that was last month. We're, we're way past that. Okay. Since you brought up the Eagles, I am happy to abuse a, uh, a, a traveler from afar. Paul, if you could stand up. Come on. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, does anybody ever read uh, Paul Thorat's articles on, uh, I, look, will you, some of you put your hands up and make them feel better? Come on, it, it make you feel better, okay. Sir, I don't know why Eagle game. Yes, and it, it's so sad, he used to live up in Beantown, and he used to be a Patriots fan until just recently, correct? <laughs> hey, you can go with the Eagles now, why not? You know, they're on a roll. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, uh, anyways, I need to um, show you on Meetup what happened to our Meetup. I don't even know. I'll figure it out. Okay. So, uh, I am not logged in. And I, can, we, can I log in as you, Rich? I don't know. Yeah. Let me try it. We don't really need to be logged in. No. So, that's close enough. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right. Anyways, this is the meeting tonight. Uh, for those of you that haven't been here much, uh, we have uh, been using Meetup for like two years now. So, you go in here and you sign up. And I'll tell you what you all do wrong. Um, it's real easy to register. Up in the upper left corner, up here, it would have a yes, I'm going, no, I'm not. Um, and what that does, if you're uh, an organizer like Rich or I, you can actually see the count of attendees and how many are on the wait list. And Meetup works really well to take care of all that for us. However, turn around and count. Are there 105 people here? No. So what that means is there's a bunch of people that said they were coming that never told us they weren't coming. So we ended up buying food for them. And that's just not right. <laughs> Unfortunately, with Meetup, we can't track them down. But we're thinking of hiring some Russians. And we should have that information shortly. So yes. Yes. OK. Good point. So um, Mr. Couric, could you stand up, please? He's one of our speakers. There, that's a good point. There's not, there are not many statues. And uh, I, I must tell you, though, I'm Polish. I, my grandfather was statue. I know lots of statues. But uh, you need your last name. And the reason is that the way Meetup works, we don't have access to your email address in any way, shape, or form. OK? But to, be, to meet at this facility, Microsoft needs to have badges. They need to have people sign in. So it is your responsibility to make your meetup profile have a reasonable name. It could be, you know, Grandmaster Coric if you want. But it, you need to have something. So if everybody could go through and clean up their name, it would really help uh, the... Uh, receptionist in the hall and help us keep track of things. It also has an impact on CodeCamp. For those of you that signed up for our CodeCamp, 
for the Saturday sessions, uh, when Rob makes the badges, he goes by whatever meetup gives us. So that's the deal. All right. So this is our only meeting uh, until uh, April. And uh, we, had a, we had a really good lab uh, last uh, uh, two weeks ago. We had a pretty big crowd here. Uh, but our lab series will start up again in the beginning of April. And uh, for you, those of you that have been coming to the labs, uh, they are usually on the first Wednesday of the month. And we just went through four months where we concentrated on React.js. And uh, of course, the last lab, we did a comparison of React, Angular, and Vue. And if you want to see all that, it's in the YouTube channel, which we'll show you in a moment. And uh, you can, if you want to watch it live, if you can't come to the meeting, you can also go to our Mixer channel where we broadcast all this stuff live. So a lot of new exciting stuff happening. The next series of labs, we're going to go back to uh, Microsoft ASP.NET Core. The newest version, which is 2. Dot something, 2.0. Okay, but there have been a lot of updates to 2.0, so we're going to be doing things like uh, Signal R, uh, Razor Pages, uh, or no, it's called Razor Pages. That's the newer way to do the MVC stuff. So we're going to spend uh, probably four or five months on that. So we have we did that probably two years ago when that technology was in infancy. So that's our next series of labs. Stay tuned on Meetup uh, when we announce that first one. Now, if you click on the Philly.net in Meetup, it shows our illustrious homepage, which oddly enough we have very little control over. It's just the way Meetup works. In the lower right-hand corner, they mention this little tiny thing called CodeCamp. Darn. Well, it seems CodeCamp is a two-day event. And here's the strategy. Did you know you can sell tickets on Meetup? Well, you can. Can you imagine what percentage they take? More than they should. <laughs> So that's why when I offer tickets for full day training for CoCamp, you have to go to our other website. And we have that all coded using, uh, we use a uh, service called Stripe. Stripe does credit card processing. Who's a major investor in Stripe? Who makes the rockets? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Very good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyways, so that's why we sell the tickets through the other website, because it saves us quite a bit of money. Um, but we're happy to report we sold 335 uh, tickets for CoCamp Friday in 45 minutes. And um, on the, uh, then we had the uh, free registration just yesterday. And it's my fault. I was busy on a phone call, and I didn't turn it on until like 10.15. Sorry. But uh, that sold out in about an hour and a half. So uh, so we're all sold out. If you don't have a ticket, <laughs> tough. So how do you get the CoCamp stuff? Well, it shows you here a link. And we are allowed to put a link on Meetup. So if you click that link, it goes to CoCamp site. And the CoCamp site is uh, still using WordPress technology that I put together years ago. Um, but it gives you the basic idea. And uh, you'll see here that we have, um, this is fascinating. Uh, do you know if you're, if you're presenting and you go to use the touch screen, it doesn't move the screen? <laughs> Thanks, Rich. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so what do we got going here? So um, you can see we've, uh, we've signed up a couple good sponsors, uh, some new ones you haven't seen before. Uh, we're going to do a, something a little different this year at CoCamp. Uh, we're going to make it so for you to win the uh, prizes at the end of the day, you have to visit the sponsors. So there'll be something that you have to, like, carry around and, 
you know, get stamped or whatever. We'll figure it out. But uh, we're just trying to get them a little more play. Um, you can see that we have six uh, gold sponsors and then a couple bronze sponsors. And going down here, I have pictures of all the speakers and all the presentations. And the ones that say sold out, those are the full day training sessions that sold out very quickly. Um, but it's really annoying to look at it this way. So what I would recommend you do is click this secret button. When you click that secret button, and then if you remember your function keys, uh, you have to press function 11. That's the best way to look at the conference. So what this does is show you all the, uh, all the Saturday uh, sessions. And uh, so if you pick one of these, who can I pick on here? Uh, Stashu, there you go. So Stashu is going to give two talks and then just click on that. And uh, so anyways, I designed this uh, uh, rich, rich broadcast this on the um, screens around the building. So this is what you want to look at to get your schedule straight. So hopefully you're going to go. That's all I have. Does anybody have any questions or anything about upcoming events? You really want to listen to data science. Okay. And then I'll bring in Dave Volt from Microsoft. And he is going to wow you if all this cool stuff you can do. You're going to show us how to figure out where to put things in uh, on a factory floor, right? That's right. You're going to show us that one. All the big data. Excellent. Actually, I saw a good um, XKCD article today from a friend. So I'll glad I remember this. I'll post it up here in a second. OK. Um, all right. Let me see if I can find this real quick before we get started. XKCD machine. All right, here we go. Perfect. XKCD is a. A comic for everything, right? Uh, so here we go. This your machine learning system? Yep. You pour the data in this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Just stir the pile until they start looking right. And this is largely uh, how some parts of machine learning work, and definitely when you're just getting started, too. So this is a great analogy, especially if you're coming from a background uh, programming. And most of us are programmers or have some kind of technical background, I'm assuming. Yes? How many of you are working with data science or machine learning actively as part of your job today? All right. How many people are uh, doing development of some sort? Coding, uh, infrastructure, IoT, anything like that? Okay. Well, so we have like kind of mixed crowd. Everyone else, I don't know what they're doing here, but we're going to have fun. So my name is David Voiles, technical evangelist. Um, look at us as developers who talk to developers. Probably the best example of something that I've seen yet. Um, you did mention uh, not um, uh, razor pages, right, which we're, we're coming out with for .NET Core. Now, there's something else also called Blazor. Have you ever seen um, the movie Dodgeball with Ben Stiller, like maybe 10 years ago? There was a scene where he's introducing his team, and he's like, look at Blazor, Blazor. So everyone's like Zer on their team, and I thought of this immediately. But anyway, a little side tangent before we get started. Uh, Blazor, new project. Um, started at one of our hackathons that we have at the company. We get plenty of time just to work on whatever, often a week at a time, and then showcase it. And I saw this in Redmond uh, maybe six months ago, but allows uh, .NET to run in the browser through something called WebAssembly. So we have Razor, and we also have Blazor. Just want to make, make you aware of it. This article is only what, six days old anyway, so interesting stuff. We didn't come here for this, right? We came for machine learning. Um, I also gave a talk last week on machine learning um, at the Philly um, Azure User Group. So I'm not going to cover too much of that content again. Whoops, wrong time. I'm not going to cover too much of that content again, but if you want to catch up on a lot of this, like book recommendations, um, we'll say more of the non-technical stuff. This would be a great place to start. My site's kind of acting up today. Um, here we go. Friday, Philly, Azure, February. Yeah, let's try this. Here we go. So you can find the recording over here somewhere on their page. Chris, where's the? Where's Chris? Okay, perfect. 
Um, so you can find the recording of uh, maybe an hour machine learning talk or data science talk that I gave last week uh, downstairs. Uh, but with that in mind, today we're going to do a little bit more coding. So if you have a computer, great. If not, no problem. You could follow along. And uh, it's all going to be in Python. How many of you are familiar with Python? OK. And then for those of you who aren't, no problem. Uh, it's a very, very straightforward and simple language. The only reason I started using it was because I kept going to hackathons with students, places like Carnegie Mellon, Stanford, at Cornell. And students would want to do everything in Python, right? They'd want to write uh, web servers and spin up websites, do data science and machine learning. So that's how I learned Python. And then later on, I found out, oh, I can actually use this for data science, too. Not much of a learning curve, so don't worry about it. We're going to make it nice and easy for you. Even better, we're going to use a tool called Azure Notebooks. So if you go to notebooks.azure.com, you can see what this is all about. So these Azure Notebooks are simply uh, Jupyter Notebooks, right? It is Python that's able to run inside of your browser. It has an interpreter and everything. It's fantastic. The alternative to using something like this, you'd have to download some tools, set up the environment on your own machine, something called a Jupyter Notebook. Usually it's not too bad, but if you're running a Windows machine, it doesn't come with Python by default. If you're running a, a machine based on Unix, maybe a, a Linux machine or a Mac, it'll come there by default, so no problem. The other part where things start to get a little tricky is there are several versions of Python. Right? There's 2.5, 2.6, 3.5, 3.6. Turns to a bit of a mess. So what this does, this allows you to um, write this Python code inside your browser and have it saved so you can easily share it with other people, you can have backups, I can download it, I can keep it all in GitHub, pull it all down, good to go. So if you go to notebooks.azure.com, in that top right corner, Yours might look slightly different, but it'll say a sign in or sign up right here. Go ahead and do that. You don't need an Azure account or anything like that. Uh, I'll just take a moment. Uh, the only thing I will say is slow down when it comes time to create a name, because it'll auto-generate some kind of silly name for you. That's the name you're stuck with. So uh, take a moment and maybe change it so it's your own name, because it added all kinds of crazy characters before my name at first. Um, but before I get into that, I'll go a little further into here to what these notebooks are and what they can do for you. So if I go down a bit on the main page, see we have a number of featured libraries here. There's Introduction to Python, Introduction to Python 3. These are the same things. I don't know why they have them listed twice. Um, we also have Introduction to R. Now R is another language often used for machine learning. Um, I've only done one course on it, so I'm not too privy on it or, or specifically how it works. But I find if you know R or Python, um, you'll be perfectly fine working with machine learning. F Sharp as well, the statue we'll go into a bit later. Don't know much about F Sharp, um, but he may be able to help us out with this in a bit. Um, but also another way of doing a lot of machine learning. Then we have other frameworks and things we can use, right? Uh, intro to CNTK. CNTK is Microsoft's deep learning framework, which kind of runs toe to toe with something else called TensorFlow that you may have heard of. TensorFlow is Google's open source deep learning framework, and really popular at this point. Um, they open sourced it three, maybe four years ago, all done in Python. And what it does is it'll greatly, greatly simplify all of the work that you have to do when using different algorithms, training models, putting all this together. I promise all this will make sense to you very shortly, too. Go down a bit more. And if you're brand new to the notebooks, after this, this talk today, what I suggest you do is take a look at something like Introduction to Python, just to make sure you're familiar with it. Move on down to getting data into your Azure notebooks. There are a couple different ways you can do this. Um, you can pull your code from GitHub. You can have uh, a CSV or Excel spreadsheet stored alongside your data and run it all there. Going down a bit more, we have things like fundamentals of data science with Python, also very helpful. So if I were to start and do this today with no background, I would say intro to Python, getting data in your Azure notebooks, and then fundamentals of data science with Python. All pretty short. You can knock most of those out in probably three hours total if you sit down and put them all together. And you have a very, very solid understanding of how all of this works. We also have other ones like Create and Deploy an Intelligent Cloud Service. I'll click on this for a moment so you can actually see what these notebooks look like. So right here, all right, it just looks like um, a giant PDF or, or text document. This is what the notebook is. Um, it is a combination of markdown Right, which is what you see on, on places like GitHub, so you can comment or document what you're doing. And then also, it has little cells where you can enter your Python code and actually see it run in real time. So right now, I can't actually run anything. If I went to hit this button, it's, it's blanked out. 
All I need to do is actually hit download, and that'll allow me to run it locally, but I don't have all those tools set up just yet. Alternatively, I can do something like clone, and because I've already created an account here, this will clone all of this into my library. So you can see right here, I have uh, notebooks.azure.com slash Dave Oils, libraries. That's gonna create a new library, a new folder called samples. And in this case, it's going to uh, have a name of samples notebooks. I'll make it public, so if I wanna expose this to other people. Some stuff I'll make public because uh, it might be workshops thing I wanna have available to everyone. Other things are private. And uh, mostly the private content I work on are things like Udemy. Have you been to a place like that before? edX, Udemy, Coursera. Like an online um, repository for videos and learning and courses and things like that. So often what they'll do is they'll give you a bunch of code to learn from. You can download that code while you have the videos playing alongside and code with them. They obviously don't want all that exposed and available to public, so that's why I make a private library. But in this case, I'll hit clone. It's gonna take a moment. It's gonna copy this from Azure into my notebooks. So now you can see I have um, uh, something called Dave Voiles Library Samples. And in a moment, yeah, here we go. Azure Notebooks, welcome, creation, deployment of Azure ML, sentiment analysis, F-sharp, all those things that I showed you before. Before we get ahead of ourselves, right, we see we have this beautiful environment to get started with. What I wanna do is give you a brief overview of AI, machine learning, and deep learning. So start over here. And again, I covered this briefly during the uh, Azure meetup, but I'll do this again. So lots of buzzwords out there, right? Uh, often you'll find, particularly on the business side of things, right, there's a big disconnect between the developers and the business folks, but I think it's kind of always been that way. You hear uh, artificial intelligence, it's gonna solve this, bots are gonna take over the world, Skynet, like you mentioned earlier. Although Skynet, maybe that will really happen. Yeah, that, that is happening. Uh, so look at, look at these as three large bubbles, right? Artificial intelligence kind of encompasses all of this. And if you use any Microsoft suite of tools, you might have heard of cognitive services, right? These are things like our vision API, um, our video indexer, um, our sentiment analysis tools. Um, these are essentially machine learning tools that we have running inside of our cloud that we expose to you through an interface like HTTP and REST. So we're building all the models and, and running it for you, and we're exposing it to you to consume as a service. Machine learning goes a little bit deeper, right? It's where we have algorithms whose performance improve as they are exposed to more data over time. Right, so these machine learning tools, they're dumb to begin with. They only know what you tell them. And when someone says, I'm building a model in machine learning, what they really mean is they're taking an algorithm, some kind of math that currently exists, and essentially turning into a function where they can pass in a bunch of parameters, right, things, columns, um, and they can have some kind of output so it can make predictions or guesses for them in the future. Finally, we have something called deep learning, which is like machine learning, but on steroids. That's when things get really interesting. NVIDIA has been one of the biggest companies leading the charge here, largely because we see things like the rise of GPUs or the, the graphical processing units, and oftentimes they're dubbed the general processing units. So these are those graphics cards, usually pretty large, maybe roughly the size of this tablet here, a little bit fatter. And at the beginning, maybe 20 years ago, they were used strictly for video games, right? They had one purpose, and that was just to crunch numbers as fast as possible, and particularly those pixels that you'd see on your screen. As, over time, people realized, okay, these uh, GPUs are very, very efficient at what they do. They do simple math, very, very fast, and they can spin off a bunch of what are called shared memory streams. Look at them as um, a bunch of threads. All right, so a massive, massive number of threads that can spin off, do work simultaneously, and then come back for you. Um, so that's where the GPU comes in. So that's why we see a sudden rise in things like machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning has been around for quite a while. AI has been around for quite a while. Alan Turing, right, maybe you've heard of this gentleman, uh, he helped uh, lead the, uh, helped the, the British during World War II to, to crack the code that the Germans were using to send messages back and forth. He had come up with something called the Turing test, which we use for often our bot framework today. So he was really like the grandfather of AI some 50, 60 years ago. So AI is really nothing new. Machine learning has been around for some time, largely with statisticians and people with math backgrounds. But the issue was a lot of this had to be done by hand on very primitive machines. And then recently, again, we've seen this huge influx of deep learning. And again, that's largely because of these GPUs, these graphics cards that we have available. 
So we have these easily accessible graphics cards, well, up until about a year or so ago when Bitcoin exploded. Uh, now we have very expensive, not easily accessible graphics cards. The Bitcoin just happened to time perfect with deep learning. Because uh, again, these things are very good at doing simple tasks and nothing but just solving math all day. So what people do is put all of these GPUs together, run them in parallel, you can have them do a ton of work, and come on back to you. So that's why I've seen a big um, sudden resurgence of things like deep learning. So think of uh, AI as largely a service that someone can offer. Machine learning is the, the math, the algorithms behind a lot of the work you're going to have to do. And when you hear math, uh, I don't want you to kind of turn off your, your head because I was very much the same way. I struggled with math my entire life. I took a few courses on, on this work and I realized you don't have to actually write most of the math yourself. These algorithms exist. In fact, we have a fantastic cheat sheet to show you exactly how this works. So um, this is what I'm looking for, the Microsoft Machine Learning Cheat Sheet. If you Google that, I have all these uh, links here that I'll send afterwards, so this way we're all on the same page. But this little cheat sheet will help you determine, OK, which uh, algorithm do I actually need right, to work in machine learning? So it looks like a whole bunch here, but we can break it down to a few different areas. We have anomaly detection, uh, very much used in places like credit card processing, right? Uh, if they see something out of the norm, they can say, OK, we catch on, and let's get a better understanding, gain some insight from this. So if you're doing anomaly detection, these would be two great algorithms to use, or two great models. Uh, going up a bit more, clustering, k-means, which basically is uh, unsupervised learning. We're going to throw a ton of data at this model. So imagine you have um, a CSV file, right? Comma separated file, uh, comma, yeah, comma separated values. Have a ton of values and columns and rows. I'm going to pass this algorithm and say, have a blast, break this up into natural groups or clusters. And then once I see them start to spread out, all these dots, the blue ones here, the purple ones there, the orange ones there, then it's up to you as the data scientist, the researcher, to make sense of them, to try to understand, well, I gave it this data, and from that data, it broke them up into these natural boundaries, these natural groups. What if I were to maybe hold back some of these columns as well? Um, we'll go into something very shortly, like the Titanic data set, a very popular data set used for machine learning. Uh, because we have so much information about that ship, things like how many passengers were there, uh, were they male or female, how old were they, um, which ticket class were they, um, which cabin were they located in. So we could take all this data. Maybe in this case, I want to remove um, the cabin information. I can take that column out, put it into this clustering model, and it can break these groups up into slightly different groups from there. So it's up to you to determine what these groups naturally mean. We have things like um, regression, where I'm trying to uh, fit a line to a bunch of data to make predictions about numbers in the future. Right? These are very heavily used in um, math-focused areas, right? Stock, uh, big banks, they're using things like that all the time. So you're going to see a ton of models out there. Do not be overwhelmed. Some of these are more helpful or more useful than others. Other ones you may not use at all. So this is a great starting point when you're trying to get uh, your, your understanding or your foot on the ground where you're going to be doing with machine learning here. So going from there, I have something else I want to show you. This is our uh, Azure Machine Learning, we'll say, uh, business guide. So um, this isn't specific or, or um, specifically for Azure as a whole. We just had a great document that I found on this. Again, I have links for all of this. You have to write this down. But what this will do is help you understand um, where do I start with this problem? And I promise we're in the code, but this is very important. And it's because I've worked on projects before where um, often people will get very excited about the idea of machine learning. Oh, this AI, this, this ML tool, it's going to solve everything for us. But not everything is a problem that can be solved by this, right? So you've got to take a step back, look at these, right? Ask some of these very simple but important questions. And if your question cannot be answered with this, well, maybe this, this just isn't the right tool for that. So I briefly spoke about regression before, right? So I want to forecast the future by estimating the relationship between variables, right? I said regression, very heavily used in financial markets, right? So it makes perfect sense right here. Let's say estimate product demand, predict sales figures, analyze marketing returns. Anomaly detection, right? I want to predict credit risk, detect fraud, catch abnormal equipment readings, 
In my personal life, this actually helped me out. I used to work in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and there's a uh, ferry that goes between uh, the Wall Street area and Brooklyn to go back and forth. My office at the time was at 50 Broadway, right next to Wall Street, and uh, my credit card was cloned. So if you haven't seen this before, blew my mind. Um, you can bring your credit card or ATM card, debit card, whatever, put it into a machine, and uh, what happens is people will often have a little chip scanner on there. Well, they'll actually grab all the data off your card. You still have your card in your pocket. Take that data, they'll fabricate a brand new card, an authentic card. And that's what happened in this case. Someone copied my card. I only knew because uh, Chase at the time had called me and said, uh, yeah, we saw that you'd used um, uh, the ferry or the water taxi today to go to work, but this wasn't the typical time that you go. I looked at this, I'm like, holy cow, they're absolutely right. And then I had to figure this out. We called the ferry company. The ferry company says, nope, your actual credit card was used. Here's a copy of you know, the stamp. And I looked at it and I said, oh, holy cow. So the bank right away said, oh, yes, because someone must have cloned your card. But that anomaly detection is what alerted them, because they say, whoa, typically you're on the 6 o'clock ferry. Now all of a sudden it's at 8 o'clock. Ah, uh, something's wrong here. There's, you know, there's very, it, it could be something or may not, but better safe than sorry. So anomaly detection, there we go. Clustering, I mentioned this before, separate similar data points into groups. Classification, identify which category new information belongs in. So go down a little bit further, you see these first few here, regression, anomaly detection, clustering, not too much to worry about. Go down to classification, and a little bit further down, I say I want to break up, uh, identify what category my new information belongs to. If it's only two categories, right, some kind of binary data, yes, no, on, off, Will this happen? Will it not happen? This is great. I can use two class classification. But maybe if I have several classes, right? What is the mood of this tweet? Sentiment analysis, very popular. What service will this customer use? Um, I look at it as uh, maybe an enumeration, right? We have a few choices that someone can choose. I want to understand which case will they end up um, going towards. So now all of a sudden I understand, okay, I need to go towards uh, Multi-class classification, and there are a bunch of different algorithms that I could choose based on the other sheet I showed you before, right? So now we have a solid starting point. We understand maybe some of the issues that we're trying to resolve. We know we start with something like uh, a classification algorithm, and then from here we can keep saying, okay, we know how to break it off from there. So again, look at machine learning works by teaching software to find patterns, right? It's going to find patterns just as well, if not better, than humans can. Go down a little bit further, and this is the bread and butter. Every machine learning uh, scenario you go to run will work this exact same way. Several steps. First, we've got to get the data. Now, you can look at it as uh, maybe something small. You just want a, a tiny CSV file. Maybe you're going to take tons and tons and tons of tweets. Right? We have all kinds of APIs that are available to us. But one way or another, we've got to get this data. Second two, and this will take most of your time hands down is preparing the data. That means cleaning it, getting rid of the columns that you don't need, removing any of the, um, uh, the data that's missing or not available, right? You don't want to start to skew your results. Maybe you have huge outliers for just a couple of your data points. You don't want them to throw things off. Get rid of them. So this will take most of your time. In a lot of the, uh, the demos, tutorials, courses you'll find, most of the data is prepared for you, but often, um, you might sit there for several days with other engineers just sifting through this data, finding out what works and what doesn't work. Going down a little bit further, further step three, we have training the model. Where we're going to feed the information into the machine, teach it what to expect. So training the model, best way to look at this, if you're a developer, right, you're going to write a function. Your function is going to have certain parameters going in and a return value. That is what training the model is in terms of developer speak. We're going to decide which parameters, which columns or features are we going to pass into this? And then what are we expecting in return? Going a little bit further, uh, what is it, train? Because everyone kind of uses different words. Score and evaluate the model. So after I um, have my testing data, we can look at, uh, uh, sorry, training and testing data, I have some kind of, uh, I might cut my data in half. Right? Maybe I have um, tons of Titanic data. I'm going to cut it in half, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to pass this data into my model, have it do some work on it, and I'm going to see how well did this model predict based on the data I gave it. Going there, one last step, because we cut our data in half, 
um, we can actually predict future demand. So I have my training data, which is how my model actually gets slightly smarter over time. Then I have finally my um, testing data. And what this does is I can put in this new data that this model has never seen before, right, going in blind, compare the two, and if both results are, are similar or matching well, then I know, okay, I'm on the right track. So it gets much, much more complicated than that, but that'd be a, a story for, for much later. Finally, at the bottom here, um, we can see that there are several different algorithms that we can choose, kind of similar to that sheet I showed you before. If you know you want to do regression, you can click on any of these examples, and I'll go into great detail about how all of them work. You with me so far? Perfect. Um, so meetup, don't need this right now. Okay, so we can actually start to code at this point. So you can go over to notebooks.azure.com if you'd like. And what I'm going to do is, oh, you know what? You may not be able to start with this one just yet because I don't have this data for you. But you, know, you can watch along as I start to code here. Okay, but what I will start with is um, how these Jupyter notebooks work. So look again, Jupyter notebook, nothing more than writing Python inside the browser. Um, but again, a huge benefit is that you don't have to go crazy with setting up your Python environment, getting all the stool, tools installed. Up here in the right-hand corner, you can see I can uh, select the different environments that I have. In this case, it's Python 3.6. I'm going to hit refresh just in case this page went to sleep on me. First thing I can do is I can have this little uh, cell, is what they call it here. Cells where I'm going to write all of my code. And you see, I can have this little pull-down, and I can tell this explicitly I want to write code, Maybe I want to put some markdown. The other two, raw NBC convert and uh, MB convert and heading, I haven't used just yet. But in terms of um, libraries, what I'm going to do is import something called pandas. Pandas is a very popular data science uh, library built on top of something else called NumPy. Um, actually, it's something else I should cover real quick before I dive into this. All the different libraries out there. Just take a minute here. I have a blog post, Getting Started with Data Science and Machine Learning in Python. Again, I'll send the links out after this. There are several libraries or frameworks that you can use when building out a lot of your tools. Some of the more popular ones include um, NumPy, which is for a fundamental package, right, for manipulating numbers and data with Python. Nearly every data science tool will use this. Pandas, built on top of it, makes it much, much easier for you to work with as well. Um, going down a little bit more, um, Scikit-learn, if I'm doing machine learning work, I will use this all of the time. All these are open source packages too. I use Scikit-learn because I won't have to actually write these algorithms or build these models myself. Instead, I could say something like um, Scikit-learn import, now I have access to that whole namespace, and I could say um, linear regression model. And now, boom, all of that math is done for me. It's saying, feed me the data. That's it. Alternatively, I could write out this all myself in Python, but there wouldn't be really be any benefit to that. Um, you might also be wondering, well, Python, how fast could it possibly be? Um, under the covers, it's all C and C++. So when you write, uh, run this Python code, um, it's actually going to call C functions that are going to do all the work for you. Um, finally, down a little bit more, we see matplotlib. This is to generate plots, histograms. Very, very helpful. You use this for um, visualizing all of the work that you're going to be doing from here. So, now I'm back in my uh, notebook here. First thing I'm going to do is import pandas as PD. So this notebook, again, is running on Azure on a Linux virtual machine, or I should say an app service. So it's a virtual machine with Linux on top of it, but I'm just one person currently making use of this for free. So anything that would be available to me inside of a bash terminal, I also have access to here. Uh, so let me go file, oops. I can go edit. Uh, what am I looking for? I was looking for insert cell above. Oh, here we go. Insert. Insert cell above. So I can go bang. This little bang sign, right, suddenly allows me to do anything in the bash terminal that I currently could do on the Linux machine. I could say ls, whoops, control and enter will list out or it will run that cell, and it'll show me everything that's currently available inside of this folder right now. Um, I can do, use something called pip, P-I-P, 
pip is a Python package manager um, that's used in a lot of these Linux machines as well. So if I ever wanted to use a package that maybe didn't exist, I could run this. Uh, so I could say pip install pandas, control enter. Let's see what happens. It's gonna say, hey, requirement already satisfied. So pandas, that framework that I needed is already installed in this machine, good to go. Remember, the alternative is you could do this all locally, but I'd have to have all of these packages installed um, as well. So first thing I'm gonna do is import pandas as pd, control enter. And that little, oh, whoops, good save. And that little star that we have on the left-hand side here means that work is currently being done. Go down a little bit more, and I'm creating a variable called ecom, so e-commerce. So I'm saying pandas dot csv, and then I'm pointing it towards this little data folder that I have, data e-commerce purchases. Yes, I uploaded this earlier. Um, this whole thing is available, actually. <laughs> I didn't even think about this. If you wanted to, let's see if, how easy it is to Google. Uh, Azure Notebooks, Dave Boyles. Yeah, here you go. If you just Google my name, Azure Notebooks, uh, it'll bring you to this page. And what you can do is you can actually copy down all of my code, too. So this is gonna show you all the the things that I have available, again, some of these are closed off, but I have something called Dave Voile's Workspace. So if you were to click on that, you'd see um, my little repository where I have all of my um, files stored. So in miscellaneous exercises, you can actually find what I'm gonna go over right now, and this one is called ecommercepurchase.ipnb. If I go back a little bit more though, uh, let's go back to lib, so inside of uh, my library's DB test lib, you have this button here, clone. If you're already signed into your notebook, this will clone all of this into your account. Now you can make changes, do whatever you want, it will not affect mine. That's a great part of this, is I can work with other people, not in real time, at least in Azure Notebooks. There's another tool you can use for that, but you can download all of my code and have fun with it as well. I like to keep everything nice and tidy, so I keep all my data, my CSVs, inside of uh, my data folder. In this case, I have e-commerce customers, e-commerce purchases. So that's how I'm getting to this file here. So in this case, I'm saying pandas. It has a function called read CSV. I'm going to my data folder. I'm grabbing it and pulling it down. Now, with ecom, it has a function called head. So and now that I've read this CSV, I have it stored in memory. I can type in head and it's going to give me the first five items that are available in that CSV. They want to make it a little bit smaller. Instead of head, I might just give head and pass in three. Oh, you know what? I'll try to run this again. Yeah, I think you're right. I didn't actually run that yet. There we go, okay. Uh, and also what kind of threw me off was um, I was deleting things, adding them before, so I wasn't sure which order I did it in. On the left-hand side here, though, now, you see how I have one, two, three. All right, it's actually showing you the order that all these things were executed in. So very similar to web code, it's going to start at the top, work its way down. So I have e-commerce. I'm saying e-commerce.head. Give me the first three items here. And you can see it starts at zero. It's an index. Um, and uh, I should say they call these uh, lists in Python, it's virtually identical to a JavaScript array. So if I kind of go back and forth, um, it, it's just me trying to leave the web development world to come here, but it takes me a moment. Um, but I can see I have my columns, things like address, lot, AM, PM, browser info, company. So this was for a, um, a dummy data for an e-commerce website for uh, a, a class that I was taking. And, um, I have all of this data, and this is probably very similar to projects or work that you would do in the real world around machine learning. So what I have to do is sift through this and come to understanding, okay, is, is all of this actually valuable to me? Well, let's see what kind of problems we want to solve along the way. So ideally, you want to start with tons of data and then narrow it down from there. Um, I can say ecommerce.columns, and what it's going to do is actually list out all of the columns for me. This is very helpful when I want to build a model because I want to make sure that I'm not mistyping these columns, especially if I have 10, 20, 30 of them. Did a project a few weeks ago in Chicago. We had like 40 columns to work with. If I had to type every one of those out by hand, I'm bound to make an error, and particularly if they're strings. So in this case, 
If I want to grab the columns and pass them into my model, this is very helpful. You also have a length function, so I can find out exactly how many items are in this column. Going down a little bit more, see how many uh, rows are here. So length ecommerce.index, and it's grabbing some number on the left-hand side over here. Uh, this is all still pandas. Again, without that simple framework, you'd have to be doing all of this yourself. Going a little bit further, I could type ecommerce.info, and you can see here, whoops, it's going to break it down for me in a somewhat easy way. I want to make sure, okay. There's another function I can run. Um, I can do ecom.tail. What that's going to do is give me the last few items there as well. This is helpful because sometimes you might look at your data and say, okay, the first five things look fantastic, but the end, maybe some of the data got thrown off or the person entering all this manually got tired or, or worn out. So this is a great way to kind of do a sanity check along the way. And again, same thing. I can go in here and just type in any number and it will shorten this or uh, elongate it for me. Going down a bit more, um, let's do ecom. Info. Oops. And see, I changed it to markdown on accident. I don't even know what the shortcut was for that. Okay, so now I have info, not as a property, but as a function. I've added these two brackets here. And now I have a little bit more. This is very helpful. I use this all the time, and for a number of reasons. You can see I have all the columns on the left-hand side. Again, it tells me how many columns, and I had to actually use that length function before to get that how much data is in here. But this is what's really important for me. It tells me that what the object type is for all these different items here. So object, 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 int64, object, int64, float. So often when you're going to start doing some of your visualizations, um, it won't work very well, and particularly machine learning models, they don't really want to use text, they want everything to be in numeric form. So what we have to do is we have to convert a lot of these objects into numbers, uh, and there's a, a function we can use to do that, and it's called um, get dummy variables. So it'll turn these objects into numbers for us, make our life a lot easier. And then also we can see things like memory usage. You think, oh, 1.1 megabits of memory, no problem. It's fine on here, but um, again, a project I worked in Chicago, it was gigs, gigs of nothing but CSV data like this. So the machine just starts to chug and really choke on that kind of data. So what we start to do is, break it down, maybe we say, okay, well, we'll break this up into smaller projects. At least when I'm running locally. On my little MacBook Pro, it'll be okay with a little bit of data. We start throwing gigs of data at it, like it just doesn't have enough RAM to even store that in memory. So in that case, maybe something like a virtual machine might work out a bit nicer for you. So even better, I can go over here, I can say ecom, and I have these little brackets, just like an array or a list, and I can pass in a string. In this case, I'm saying purchase price. All right, if I look over here, um, I can see there's actually a column called purchase price. And once I have access to that column, there's a number of functions that are available to me. So we can see we have the average um, value found in that column, it's 50. Let's go a little bit further here. Say, uh, I should say escape B will actually uh, bring me down to a new cell as well. Super helpful to know these shortcuts, especially when you're writing code all day. So ecom, um, and I believe I can also start to type purchase price, sometimes this changes. No. Yeah, IntelliSense can be kind of wonky sometimes, <laughs> especially on an object this big. Okay, so if I just do dot, it'll start to give me all of the different properties or functions that are available to me. And you see it's like absolutely massive right here. So uh, remember I showed you before how I imported pandas? I just said import pandas as PD. That's helpful because I don't have to pollute the global namespace. If I just imported everything, said import pandas, right? I would have access to all of these without ever having to type PD. Um, but as I start to add more frameworks, Seaborn for visualizations, matplotlib, uh, scikit-learn, then I'd have hundreds and hundreds of these things. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I think that there was a column. Yep, columns. Oh, no, no. I wanna make sure I have the right thing here. Ecom.coms dot, no. I used to be able to get to this by just typing in the name of the column itself, but oh well, it doesn't want to work for me today. 
But uh, in this case, you can see how we can actually get this column. We can get multiple columns at once as well by passing in an array, too. Um, going down a little bit more, I can see I have things like mean, max, minimum. But let's go a little bit further. I want to answer a question, like how many people have English, EN, as their language of choice on this site? So if someone asks me a question like that, the first thing I'm going to do is pop up the head again so I can get a good feel for what all of these columns look like. So I scroll over, and I can see language. Okay, we have EL, FR, DE. So I know I'm looking for uh, a string that's no more than two characters, and particularly EN. So first thing I'm going to do is get that um, data, that CSV, get the language column, I'm going to do a little um, check here, right? A Boolean. I'm going to say, uh, give me uh, that entire column, and I'm checking if this is true, this value, en. So I can see in the first few things here, right? Zero, false, nope, not English, not English, not English. So, ah, but in 11 and 12, I see that it looks like those people have English listed as their main language. But just to be sure, let's go to um, ecom.iloc. And that's going to um, give me, the, uh, I'm going to say, I want the, I'm going to pass you an integer for that location, and I want you to give me that value back. So ecom, actually, uh, language, I'm going to say, give me back the thing at the 12th item. Yep. So from that language row, I can see that the 12th thing returned is, in fact, English. If I go up here, 12 is English. True. Perfect. Let's take one step back, though. And from all of Ecom, give me the item located at number 12. Looks like this is a person located at 733 Heather Rest. And let's see, language, English. Perfect. There we go. So again, very helpful to also understand this ILOC um, property. So I can take this ILOC, pass in whatever number. Remember, these lists or rays are uh, zero based. And I get more data about that individual right there. Going down a little bit more, same thing here. I'm saying I want to get column values for everyone who has English listed as their primary language. So I'm getting my CSV, my pandas data frame, and I'm saying from the whole data frame, give me this language. I want to check if English is true, yes or no, and then give me a count for each one of these. That's what's starting to return right here. So I could see 1098. So this is giving me the number of, uh, of values for all of those properties. But what if I want just to see how many people have it listed? I just want the number here. Here you go. Going a little bit further, though, how many people have their job title listed as lawyer? So again, I'm going to grab my CSV file. I'm going to pass in a little function that's saying, I want to just look for the job column and check if job is equal to lawyer. Let's go back. Let's go to ecom down ahead. If I go over, we see job. We have scientist, product process development, drilling engineer, customer service engineer. So we have all kinds of jobs here. But in this case, I'm just looking for my whole data, specifically the job frame or column, looking for a lawyer, and I want to get how many people have that job. Looks like 30. This is simply another way of doing that same thing. We have this length function that we can run on just about anything. Yes? We have a question from the chat. Sure. So the question is, if I want to export this and put it in a file, what would that be? OK. If I wanted to export those results in a file, how would I do it? Um, so there's a bunch of manipulation we can do with these. Pandas calls them data frames. Look at them as nothing more than columns and rows in this format. Um, there's a function to do that. So off the top of my head, pandas save, uh, save CSV. There we go. Yep. So I, that function, pandas.dataframe.toCSV. So let's do that. We have a number of parameters here. This might be a good... Good starting point, too. So to show us a little bit more. So I want to save this. Uh, let's go up one. I'm going to say ecom.save. Sometimes the tab or, or autocomplete might take a moment here. What was that? Um, data frame. Oh, because I'm misspelling it. It's not saved. It's actually two underscore CSV. So let's go two. CSV. 
And if I don't have the documentation in front of me, maybe I'm, I'm not lucky enough to have two monitors, what I can do is I can actually go back into this and do shift tab. Do, 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 do. Gives me a little bit about uh, all the parameters I can pass in. So I know that it's gonna need a path or a buffer, none is the default value. So I'm gonna say path or buff equals, I'll do whack whack, hold on, data slash my data, and that should be it. Yeah, because everything else has an equal sign, meaning that it's optional. All right, so we have tons and tons and tons of things there. So all kinds of manipulation you can do. Date format, light term, uh, line termination. So let's try this out, wish me luck. No, file not found. No such file directory. Whack, whack, data, my data. Uh, sorry, what's that? Oh, maybe. You sir are right. Kudos to you. Now let's go back. I'm gonna refresh this page. My data. CSV. And this probably should be like a huge CSV file. Let's see what it looks like. Well, huge, relatively speaking. Boom, there we go. So that is how you do that. Yes. Oh, that's it. I see a black screen up there. Oh, there we go, 10 minutes. The screen went black, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I have that death stare into the screen. 10 minutes, okay, so um, this is very helpful when we start to start actually dropping rows, manipulating our data. Maybe I wanna bug the database admins all the time to keep giving you new data or keep saving it for you. So in that case, you have a lot that's available to you as well. Um, I'll tell you, I keep the docs open all of the time in another screen because there's a lot going on. There are tons of frameworks here. Um, you do not want to be writing all of this from scratch. So that's where this stuff comes very helpful. A graph, absolutely. So good point because I have some questions here. You can answer them yourself when we're done. But see, we have tons of data. I wanted to understand how we can manipulate a lot of this Python. If we go a little bit further, this, this will be very helpful for you. This is the Titanic data set that I briefly discussed before. Before I said we have to import a number of frameworks or libraries. We have pandas, which we used before. NumPy, which is lower level math manipulation. Matplotlib, which you'll use for all of these because it is your, your frame for charting, for graphing things. And then finally we have Seaborn, which is built on top of Matplotlib and it will make all the, the charts and graphs nice and beautiful for you. Finally, we have this little thing. It's called uh, magic function, magic variable, maybe magic keyword, one of those. But essentially what it does is say, when I create a chart or a graph, just put it in line with the rest of this. Otherwise, if I don't have this line in here, matplotlib in line, every time I go to make a chart or graph, it's actually gonna have it as a pop-up inside the browser, so not really convenient. So going down a little bit so I can visualize some of this, right, I have something called training, so my train data, and you see I'm going to my data folder, giving titanic underscore train.csv, and like I mentioned before, we have passenger ID, whether or not someone survived, passenger class, name, gender, blah, blah, blah. Keep going down. Let's go down here a bit. First thing I wanna do is I want to start to make sense of all this. So, I create a, uh, first thing I do is create something here called is null training df, data frame, columns and rows. So I'm doing is saying, take that training data, that Titanic data, and I'm looking to see if anything is null. That's kind of what I did right up here. Let's see, hey, where are all of these null values? So I'm gonna use Seaborn to plot and visualize all of this. Right now I'm gonna have a function. It's gonna return false if the data is null, true if it is not null. So we have, whoa, we have all kinds of, or this stuff's full, but if I go down here, I have quite a bit that is missing. So if we go down here, I have a function called SNS, Seaborn, dot heat map and it's gonna draw a nice visualization for me. So it's gonna say, hey, I need some kind of data. Remember we have uh, IntelliSense here. Saying data, and data does not have an equal sign. So that means that it is not optional. I must give it something. If it has an equal sign, it's optional, and that is the default value set right next to it. So in this case, I'm giving it the Titanic data, and I'm saying Y tick labels false. Y ticks would be over here. We'd have tons and tons and tons of numbers, because I think we have thousand people or something on the ship. So I'd have a tick for each person on there. I said, don't even want them. Um, C bar, don't remember what C bar is here. But then I have a color map as well. Now, there's a bunch of different colors available. So if I remove this, you'll see what I mean. 
Oops. Uh, for some reason, the color didn't display at all. That's nice. Oh, that's right. Maybe that's it. No, same thing. Oh, well. But there's a bunch of different colors that you can add here. Uh, in this case, it is not for some reason. Someone's jinxed me. Um, I thought there was a way to go back. Maybe not. Oh, well. So anyway, I know um, uh, CMAP equals, we need a string. If you want to see what these look like, uh, let's go Seaborn CMAP. See all the color palettes available to you. <laughs> Here we go. Beautiful. So I could say color palette HLS. Let's try HLS or, or Hustle, H-U-S-L. Don't know what that is. H-U-S-L. Run this again. Oh, it doesn't want to work for some reason. That's nice. That's my luck. What is this saying? Uh, it's saying not recognized. Okay, unless I misspelled that somehow. H-U-S-L. Maybe it's colors. Yeah, I'm just going to copy. Uh, whoops. I'm going to copy any of those, pass those in. You see what I mean? Like, it would be impossible to remember <laughs> all of this. Uh, of course, now it doesn't want to work. Oh, you know why? Okay, so remember I said that uh, Python Turbo is going to stop, start at the top of the page and work its way down? So what happened was, as I went on in the sample, I actually remove all those um, not available columns. So all the data, I actually uh, either fill in the missing data or remove it. So what I can do is I can go over here, kernel, restart, and run all. Yeah, so, uh, and, <laughs> yeah. So I heard about this Skynet thing coming after me. Um, so what I can do instead is I took my training data, and um, rather than make a copy of it, I passed in a parameter called in place all the time, and I just did it, edited that data immediately. If I wanted to make a copy and edit that, I could have done the same thing. So kind of these tick plots are showing me what's missing and what's available. Now I'm going down here. I want to find stuff about age and cabin information. So or see who survived and who did not survive. So it looks like quite a few people did not survive on this ship, unfortunately. But maybe 300 something did. So what I'm going to do is say I want to pass in uh, CS, CNS, SNS. I want to do a count plot. And I'm going to say for my X column, I want to uh, pass in the survived column from my data set. And we're going to draw something up like that. A little bit further, another count plot. But now, rather than just saying, uh, checking whether or not they survived and comparing two variables, I can go over here and I can compare three, right? I can actually add gender to it. And I can do that by um, setting my hue, right, the actual colors, or the, the, the color itself, to be set to gender. So this way I can add a little more detail, a little more complication to some of my data. So uh, SNS or Seaborn will be very, very helpful for doing some of this. Finally, I'll leave you with uh, the distribution plot. So what this will do is I am, uh, OK, drawing distribution plot. I'm going to try to find the average age of the person on the ship. You can see over here, it looks like there are a bunch of people who are absolutely infants. We have a little drop right around here. It doesn't seem to be anyone at all. I go over a bit more. Most people seem to be maybe late 20s, early 30s in, in this area. So I can actually have this line called KDE, which is this normalization line over here. If I don't want that, I can just take this out, and you won't see it again. So this data, again, just kind of visualizing everything, dropping data that's not really relevant to what I want. If I go down to a bit further, um, Remember I said I need to convert my categorical data, my strings, into numbers? That's what I'm doing here with get dummies, taking my training data, getting the sex or gender column, and I'm going to turn those all into zeros or ones. And there's more to it if you go down a bit more. I made this all available to you so you can explore it as well because I wouldn't have enough time. I've got about three minutes left at this point. Um, if you go down a bit, bit further, um, what I was trying to do in this example was try to predict whether or not someone would survive based on a number of different parameters. If you want to go a little bit deeper with this, there's a great website called Kaggle, and Kaggle Titanic. So Kaggle, I believe, is owned by Google, but great place for um, 
great place to um, get started with machine learning. So a lot of people contributing to what they're doing. Big companies are all, uh, often sharing their data and having competitions there. Um, there was one from an insurance company. I know I'm drawing a blank right now. State Farm, right, where they had a bunch of data. Uh, they, they took images of people in a closed course, uh, distracted driving, and they broke up these images into 10 different categories. Right? That's what we're trying to predict here. 10 different categories. And they said, hey, everyone, build a model, train it, give us your feedback, and we'll reward the person who has the highest uh, precision and accuracy on this. So this one's a couple years old, Titanic data set, another great way to learn. But the reason I like these is because they have a great description of the, uh, each competition. There's frequently asked questions, see how people are evaluating these things. But even better, um, they'll have you know, people answering, uh, answering and asking questions along the way. They'll show you which models work, which ones haven't worked. Um, so it looks like they launched this one five years ago and it doesn't close for two years. There's other ones that have opened and closed in the meantime. I know Netflix does one every year. It's called the Netflix Challenge, where they try to have people compete to see, can your ML algorithm beat what we currently use? And uh, in many cases, it actually does. It uses something called ensemble learning, which is using a bunch of different models and taking the best results from each. But the problem with their method is, the ones that typically win, is that um, they'd be so costly to actually implement with their services that it wouldn't be very beneficial. Um, but great way for you to learn and understand what's happening. Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E. Again, I'll give them all the notes, or Bill, I'll give you guys the notes that I have after this for everything that I covered. There's a lot more that I could have gone over, our cognitive services, some more documentation. But I encourage you to take a look at a bunch of these. And finally, uh, take a look at this blog post that I have on getting started with data science. I point you towards useful libraries for visualizations. These are probably the most common ones that you lose along, use along the way. So once you learn Python, and really when you learn the frameworks more than anything else, um, it'll open up an entirely new world for you. And finally, um, some Udemy courses and book recommendations. Now, I know that there are other things out there. I can only tell you what's really worked for me. So I encourage you to take a look at some of these. And most of the courses are $11, $12, and these four books. Final note. This book, yes. This book, I would highly, highly, highly recommend. Um, Hands-on machine learning with scikit-learn. So that's how the machine learning part and TensorFlow, the deep learning part. It's fat. It's like this big. I absolutely beat that book up. I have notes in the margins and highlighted and um, give an idea. Like I get kind of crazy with all my learning. I have these little tabs. If you're not using OneNote, you're crazy. I keep all these tabs, and this is just me taking notes throughout the day about regression types, the evaluation metrics. So it's a lot. Coming from a developer background to do this, um, it's got a bit of a learning curve and additional resources. So take a look at those, and I'd be more than glad to answer questions after this or come find me afterwards. Thank you. Excellent. Dave's come quite a way from working construction in the streets of New York. So. That's right. <laughs> All right, up next uh, we have Stasha Kirk. So it'll take him a minute or two to get wired up. Chris, how many, uh, how many people have we had online? This, uh, it's, uh, 17, that's pretty good. So hey everybody, thanks for coming. And uh, there's a lot of great information tonight. You see a lot of stuff flying by in your browser. So we have a YouTube channel. Um, it's pretty easy to get to, youtube.com slash philly.net. And as usual, if you're a veteran around here, you know we spell philly.net, philly, D-O-T-N-E-T. -E you go there and you find our replay, which is usually up within 24 hours. We also put all the links to everything you see tonight. We've uh, got a cool utility called OneTab and gather everything up in there. The folks on Mixer already have them. So thank you for watching on Mixer. We got a little bit of a head start on that. Back to Bill. And mixer.com slash philly.net, D-O-T-N-E-T, philly, D-O-T-N-E-T. If you ever can't make it here, just join us there. And we're switching over. Uh, we'll switch over for Stashu in just a moment. If you're interested in how these guys are doing the recordings, um, Chris is going to give a talk at CoCamp. 
and explain all the technology he and Rich used to do this. Um, it's a pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, there's an on button at the top. All right, what about now? Blah, blah, blah. Closer. I don't know how much closer I can get. You can just awkwardly hold it like this the whole time. Does this work? It looks absurd, but if it's functional, no? I think it looks nice. Yeah. To get a little bit closer here. I don't know. I can talk loudly. Maybe that will help. All right. Cool. Uh, so, hi, everyone. My name is Stashu. I'm pretty much the F sharp guy in the area. Uh, before I get too deep in here, all the links in the slides are available on my website, stashu.net. Uh, so, everything that we'll cover, you can check out there. So today we'll be going over four topics. Number one, F-sharp, what is it? You know, why should you bother picking up this, what I think is a fantastic tool? Uh, and we'll actually get into some data science examples tonight, just you know, why F-sharp or why so many people go to F-sharp for data science. Secondly, we'll talk about Fable, which is a tool you can use to take your F-sharp source code and convert it into JavaScript, thereby using the whole JavaScript ecosystem in a very type safe way. Number three, we're going to be talking about Fable Elmish, which is a architecture built around the Fable ecosystem. And finally, we're going to be talking about the safe stack, which is using f -sharp both on the client side of a web application and on the server side. So a lot to talk about. A little bit about me. i software developer at Academy of One. I work in the higher education space. I actually don't write f -sharp on, on my day job most days. I do a little bit for ETL, but most of the time, I'm, I'm just you know, writing c -sharp, .NET, full stack, you know, the normal stuff. I recently moved to Philly, yay sports. Uh, if you want to contact me, all this info is up there. And I'm pretty much the F-sharp guy in the, in the area here. I've been doing these talks for a long time. I'm still excited about it. Uh, in fact, you know, I've, I've been giving conference talks. I host a podcast about it. I even met my significant other while giving a talk here about F-sharp. So <laughs> anyway, so first thing we're going to be doing is talking about F-sharp itself and why I love it so much. So first off, you know, what, what is it? So it's a mature, open source, cross-platform, functional first programming language. If you go to the official F-sharp uh, website, fsharp.org, that's the slogan they have at the very beginning. So I want to kind of break that down for you. Again, all these links are online. So number one, it's mature. It's been around for a very long time. It's been in development and released since 2005. Uh, it's open source since 1.0, since the initial release. It's always been very community heavy and community friendly. It's cross platform. Since 2.0, you've been able to run it on Mac, Linux, and Windows. And finally, it is functional first. And functional first, we won't get too much into functional programming tonight, but it basically means you, you think more about your functions and how the data flows than you think about how different objects react. So it's just a little bit different from object oriented programming, but we won't get too much of that tonight. More importantly than you know, any of those like maturity or any of those kind of aspects, I want to talk about a few C's. Number one, F sharp is very concise. You can do a lot with very little code. So the first example we have right there, uh, again, by the end of the night, don't expect to know all the syntax. It's just not really possible. Uh, but what we have right there is we have a list that goes from 1 to 100. We can sum that up in a very link-like way, if you're used to C-sharp link, and we can print that out. And we can print that out in a type safe way. So that percent %d that you see over there is a string uh, that's basically saying, only accept certain types here. So if I try to input a string instead of some kind of number, that will actually yell at me at compile time. Secondly, if I want to create really simple functions, like squaring a number, I don't have to go through all the extra curly braces and all that kind of stuff. To define that function, I can do that very simply. So right there, I have a function that just squares a number, takes in something x, multiplies it x times x, and the type, you know, the fact that it's taking in an int and returning an int, that is all figured out by the compiler based on the fact that I'm using that multiplier right there. So very concisely, you can do a lot of stuff. And then, of course, you can use that function very quickly. 
addition to that, creating types is very simple. So right there, if you can imagine, I have a class that has two different properties, a first name of a string and a last name of a string. In C Sharp, that would take a few lines, and I would see my getter setters, whatever. In F Sharp, I can do that in just one line. Uh, this is what's called a record type. So we have your normal classes and interfaces. We also have our other kinds of types. So this record type represents just a small amount of data. Again, these are, this is basically like a, a class with two properties here. And we can create more complex types very uh, succinctly as well. So an employee, it can be either a worker, where they're, they're just some kind of person, or they can be a manager in which they're managing a number of different employees. We can represent that very concisely. I can take this to some kind of business analyst and, and basically say, hey, does this make sense? So that conciseness helps a lot in conversations when you're dealing with people in the, in the domain. In addition to being concise, F Sharp is very convenient. A lot, a lot of the work you would typically have to do in C Sharp to make, to wire up some things, you don't have to do as much work. Uh, for example, by default, we have structural equality. If I create a type called person, and I create two objects of that, or two, two instances of, of that, both of first name John and last name Doe, when I try to compare those two in C Sharp, it'll say it's, you know, it's not the same because it'll check the object reference. By default, F Sharp will actually look at the internals of you know, what data actually exists inside of there. So it's very convenient in that way. If you do want referential equality, all you have to do is put an attribute on the person type itself, and you can get your normal referential equality. In addition to being convenient, it's, it's correct. There's, there's a lot of uh, stuff that F Sharp does to make sure that you don't do the wrong thing. For example, uh, if I have some kind of units in meters and some kind of units in feet, I probably shouldn't be adding those without converting them. F Sharp has a feature called units of measure that will give me compile time errors when I try and do things like this. So at compile time, it'll, it'll yell at me if I, if I try to, to add or work with numbers of different types. And then you know, once it's actually compiled and it's in IL, all that kind of stuff is erased. So pretty interesting. And finally, it is very complete. Anything that C Sharp can do, F Sharp can do, typically in a more concise way. We have right here an interface. Because it just has abstract members, it's implicit in the interface. I see one question. Yes. By default, wait, sorry, can you rephrase the question? Yep. Sure. Oh, by default, that's how it is. So when F Sharp compiles its code, it goes from top to bottom, both in a single file and within your folder structure in general. So and, and until it's defined, you, you just can't be using it. So null is, it, it, it's not like Python that respect or any other OOP language. Um, null isn't really something we have in F Sharp. We, we, can, we can deal with it, because a, a lot of the time we're dealing with C Sharp code, but you can't really create null and then have null reference exceptions. So, so that's just a little bit of you know, why I love F Sharp. What I'm going to do now is go into demos. I would open up Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. And we can see it in action and see what it, it feels like to actually be using this. So I'm going to jump over first to Visual Studio. Again, all these slides are, will be online here. And what I want to do is I want to explore a very simple problem. I have some stock data. It's CSV format data. Uh, can anyone not see this, by the way, before I proceed too deep? Cool. So I have some CSV data, which just has a number of columns. So I have date, open, high, low, close, et cetera. And I have a task to take that data and get the date for the highest variance in stock. So the variance in stock is basically, you know, what's the largest difference between the open and close in a specific day? I'm, I'm very interested in, in finding out when that was. Maybe I'm using this for statistical predictive purposes or something like that. So in, in F Sharp, I think it's, it's, it's really nice that we can typically write pseudocode first or what we think the, the flow of data is going to be like. And then really simply, we can go from that pseudocode to real implementation. So when I look at this problem, I'm, I'm naturally thinking through, you know, what, how am I going to take this data if I you know, actually had a spreadsheet or something? How am I going to take that data and get to that solution here? And, and naturally, I'm thinking, OK, first thing is I want to you know, remove the noise and only look at the data I'm caring about 
I want to fill. I want to sort it by what's the difference between the high and the low, and then I want to take the date from that. And so, in F sharp, what I can do is I can basically do exactly what I just said. I can I can write pseudocode that looks very similar to my thought process. So I have some data. I'm going to say I'm going to skip the header row because you know CSV file I don't really care about the header row itself. I'm going to project to some fancy type where I only have you know, the, the pieces of information in that CSV data that I care about. I want to order it by the difference descending, so the difference between the high and the low amounts. I want to take the head or that first element of that, and I want to get the date from the record. And if, if now, now that I've written out the pseudocode in F sharp, what I can do is I can just fill in these functions and, and not really have to change any of that pseudocode, and everything will work for me. So that stock data is right here. And you can see, if I scroll down a bit, the pseudocode that I kind of typed out for myself is still in place, and all I've done is implemented these functions above. And so this, this ability to, to take my train of thought and basically use a link-like syntax, as I would have in C Sharp, is, is very convenient for me. In addition to that, uh, it's, if, if I want to explore this data, I can use the F Sharp interactive window. So if I highlight some code and use Alt-Enter, that code is actually being sent to this little interactive window down here, and I can work with this. So I'm going to highlight that stock data, send that down here if I wanted to, just like if I'm in Google Chrome or something, I could work with that uh, and, and, and do whatever I wanted in here. But in addition to that, I can actually send more and more functions from my F -sharp source code files itself uh, to a point where you know, if, I, if I send these different things, so I have my fancy type, where it's just the data I want. I define this escape header row, which is going to skip one thing. These are very similar to our normal link functions. I, if I throw in some more implementation details of how we're dealing with this, and if I finally define our you know, resultant function where we use all these different bits, then I can just call the result here. Oh, what did I do? I forgot to highlight one thing. All right. And finally, if I want to get the result of it, all I have to do is call it there. So quickly in Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, I can use this language. I can create some kind of pseudocode solution to what I want to do. And I can execute it very quickly and explore my data in a, in a type safe way, uh, which, which for me helps a lot. And then finally, once I've filled in those functions and, and done some pseudocode, I can then just go and clean up that data, or sorry, clean up that code. So. You know, we don't have all those redundant functions or, or noise. So F, F Sharp is great for doing pseudocode-driven development. In addition to that, it's really good at data science. And the reason I say that is there's a lot of data scientists either, you know, people under that whole bubble of machine learning, data science, big data, uh, GPU processing, that kind of stuff. A lot of these people choose F Sharp. And one of the reasons they choose F Sharp is because of a feature it has called type providers. Type providers are some magical feature in F Sharp where you basically provide the equivalent of a connection string, and it gives you types. So it looks at all the data that's relevant to that connection string, and it instantly gets types. So I noticed that on the Philly.net website, if you go to the schedule grid, doo -doo -doo, if you go to the schedule grid here, I saw that Bill, or whoever coded up the site, was using some JSON data to, to populate this, you know, if you if hit Control U here, you get some source code going down, and he's using Angular to represent it. But I saw this URL here, and if you go check out this URL, you'll see JSON returned. And I, I know I'm going to be hitting your your web server, so I'm sorry if you got, if, I, if these guys check it out and knock you down. But anyway, so we get some JSON here, and and you know, Bill said that the best way to deal with uh, to look at the schedule for Philly.net code camp was to do it via that schedule grid. I say no, F sharp is actually the best way to consume that data. <laughs> Challenge accepted. So what do I do? So, so I grab the URL for, the, uh, for that JSON. I call something called a JSON provider. JSON provider is something that takes in either a reference to a, a JSON file on disk uh, JSON URL or it's some inline JSON, and it automatically creates types that I can use at compile time. So all I've done is I've I've loaded up a few uh, references here, so it opens you know basically like using in in C sharp, 
I've created a reference to that URL. I'm going to grab some sample data. And if I want to just print out the list of talks that are happening at the Validity Night Code Camp on the Saturday, I can do this in a very type safe way. So what I'm doing is I'm going to iterate through all the items in the array that are being returned here. I just want to print out the speaker and the, um, and the title of their talk. So I'm going to use printfn, which is kind of like a console write or something. I'm going to say speaker percent %s. And if I just do a dot, what it's going to do is it gives me the types for the stuff that was happening over there. So in a, in a type safe way, I've gotten you know, context right here in Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code. So here, I'm going to grab the speaker. And if I put my cursor over here, it'll actually tell me that the speaker is a string. And let's say I also want to grab the title of the talk, percent %s. Then I can do the exact same thing here, where I can get the title. Oop. So I've, you know, I, if I grab that data, do, 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 and then I take this list and I want to just print it out, I can do it just like that. So, so I have all the talks output right here. So if I want to explore data, whether it's JSON or whether it's SQL or whether it's XML or whatever kind of data source I have, there's usually a type provider for it. So of course, you know, sports just happened and Eagles won. And I'm not a sports person at all, but I am a nerd. Uh, so naturally what I want to do is I want to find a website that has data about, about the Super Bowl and who's won the Super Bowl. And I want to consume it with F Sharp, because why not, right? So I found this table on the internet. It's got a few columns. It's got you know, a list of sports teams. You know, we got the Steelers here. We got whatever. And we have some other data, specifically the wins, the losses, et cetera, you know, how many times they've won a loss and participated in the Super Bowl. And so what I want to do is I want to take this data and output you know, how many people have won the Super Bowl one time versus two times, et cetera. So I have this URL to some HTML. And in Visual Studio Code, very much like how I use that JSON provider, I can do something very similar with an HTML provider. So I'm going to get a reference to that data, grab the sample data, grab the rows from that. So right here, what I'm actually doing is, you know, F Sharp has automatically created data types for me. It's looked at everything that's on that website, and it's found specifically for me that there's a table there called 28 teams, blah, blah, blah. The way it did that is it looked at your, it looked at the HTML, it actually did a web request, I found that there was a title just above it, and it said, hey, that's probably the name of the title. So, yeah, I know, it's crazy, right? Right. Um, you can do this exact same thing with SQL databases. So if you have you know, 50 columns and 20 tables, you can have static type. You, know, you don't have to create any anything framework BS. You can just go to town. Anyway, so right here, we have the tables we want to consume. We have a bunch of data that we're pulling actually from that website. And I want to do some things with it. And you know, we don't really have to worry about this code specifically. But what I'm doing is I'm taking this data. I'm going to figure out how many teams have won once versus twice versus three times, et cetera. I'm going to print that out on my console here. And I can do that in a type safe way. So you know, for example, I want to print out the team. Whenever I print out a specific team, I have all those columns available to me. TM was derived by the fact that on this thing, the column for teams is TM. And if I, if I highlight this and I run it, we can see that appropriately, one team with one win are the Philadelphia Eagles. Yay. Sports. <laughs> so you get the point that there's a, there's a lot of ability to work with data in a very type safe way. And as a data scientist, a lot of your job is kind of fiddling with data and working with data. In addition to consuming data, in a very efficient manner. Sometimes you want to be able to create graphs really quickly. So what you can do is use something called FSLab. FSLab is basically a, a, a group of NuGet packages. And with FSLab, you can, what's up? Yep. Oh yeah, I, I, explicit, I explicitly excluded that. We don't care about those losers, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
Anyway, um, so with FSLab, what I can do is I can uh, look at all kinds of data and I can output. So here I'm using something called the World Bank Database. Basically, it's someone collected a bunch of data like GDP and mortality rate and all kinds of stuff from different countries. And I can consume that in F Sharp naturally. Uh, what I'm specifically interested in here is the employment, uh, you know, the unemployment ratios of Canada versus the United States. And if I, if I do a little bit of work, I can get that data in a, in a type safe way. I've got to scroll down here so this is doing the right thing. Good. And if I want to take that data and I want to output uh, a chart with that, I can, I can do that. I can, in real time, uh, take that data and say, I want to output that to a Google chart. So as a data scientist, I probably want to be looking at all kinds of charts in real time. So everything that we did in IPython notebooks or the Jupyter notebooks, whatever they're called, we can do that within our normal environment. So pretty, pretty cool. So, so that's, that's a lot about why I love Fable, or sorry, why I love F Sharp. This is the point in time where I normally get questions of the forum, yeah, okay, but can I do a blank with F Sharp? Yep, is there a Yeah, type a providers are pretty popular in the chat, and one of the questions, if this is relevant, is uh, could you rename a property after you've, you know, because it, it looks like you can just start, quote unquote, dotting in yep. without knowing anything about what you've reached. So. That was a question, if you can elaborate a little bit, and then I'll sure. let you move yeah, on. Yeah, so all the types that are being used at in Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, or ever you're using, you can also use Writer, are, they're static. They're, you, you can't change those types. What you can do is you could define your own types and then project to that with the data that you actually care about. So, you know, of course, TM for team isn't something I want to be working with. It doesn't read very well, but I can easily project from that to the actual type. Another really big advantage of type providers is that let's say I'm targeting some SQL table somewhere and some DBA decided they're going to change the name of a stored procedure or change the name of some column in a database. Right now, your entity framework code will not yell at you at compile time for those changes. This code will no longer compile once those things happen. I think that's very good. You want to get uh, errors as quickly as possible so you don't have you know, production failures or anything. Anyway, so right now, is where I get a lot of skepticism and I get a lot of questions of, yeah, okay, but can I do blank with F sharp? So I'm gonna answer some of those questions before you have the chance to ask them. So first question is, okay, but can I you still use OOP? Answer, of course, is yes. If you wanna have normal C sharp classes, you can do that. We don't need to worry about the exact same code here. But the point is we can do it. Can I have interfaces? Yes, interfaces are just classes without any uh, concrete members, right? can I still use OOP or can I still use extension methods? Yeah, in fact, you can do it in two lines of code. All you have to do is reference the, line, the, the type you're extending, say the word with, and then add the member. And again, this can interop with your C-sharp code. So I can create an extension method at F-sharp and then use it in C-sharp here. Another question is, yeah, but can I write scalable and, per and performant code? A lot of people look at functional programming languages and the skepticism over time has been okay, but it doesn't perform too well. I, I, I see that as BS. Right here, we have an entire book dedicated to writing scalable and performant code. This guy will actually be giving a full day talk at philly.net on one of the Friday sessions on how to do this. Um, I actually recorded a podcast episode with him recently as well. So you can absolutely write scalable and performant code. Okay, but can I create desktop applications? Yeah, I wouldn't typically recommend it, but you can. You can use WinForms, there's bindings for that. You can create you ETO forms, which is kind of some off-brand uh, WinForms wrapper. You can use WPF, you can use Xamarin, and you can use Electron. Electron being a technology where you take JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and create a web, uh, create a desktop application. Later, we'll see how we can do that with Fable. So we can absolutely create desktop applications. Next question I get, okay, but can I interop with blah, blah, blah? Yes, of course. Uh, F Sharp is just another .NET language, so I can, use the IL that it outputs and just interoperate with it in C Sharp as I normally would between C Sharp and VB. Can I interoperate with R? Actually, we have type providers for R. If you want to call the functions that are in the R language, I can do it in a type safe way. The same way that those JSON properties were generated, we generate R functions that we can use. Uh, we also used to have a Python type provider. It's a little bit broken right now, but 
if that gets back up and running, we could do the exact same thing and, and have statically typed at reference to these Python functions. Finally, can we interact with JavaScript? Yes, with Babel. We'll see how to do that in just a bit. And last, most important questions, okay, but can I find learning resources? Absolutely, it's my bookshelf, it's, I call it my fun shelf because where all my functional programming books are. Uh, I also host a podcast called WTF Sharp. It's two episodes in right now. I love the domain name. You gotta give me props for that. Um, I was pretty happy when I, when I thought of it. We have two episodes out right now, one on Fable, one on dealing with concurrency. I, I know, WTF Sharp is concurrency, it's pretty cute, right? Um, so if you want to learn more about this, um, if you want to actually hear a lot more in depth about Fable specifically, I got full 40 minutes on that and another hour on concurrency. And we'll have more episodes coming up very soon. In addition to learning resources I'm particularly interested, all the major publishers have tons of F-sharp resources. Manning has a few books. A-Press has a few books. If you're in a plural site, they have 11 courses right here one on consuming type providers, one on building your own type providers, so you can you know, automatically generate types on the fly for your special kinds of data sources and all kinds of other courses. If you're into more books, Packet has tons of books on the subject, and uh, you can always ask me if you need more F-sharp things. So those are some of the reasons why I love F-sharp, why I see it's a very valuable tool for us to all pick up as .NET developers. What I want to do next, is go into Fable. Before I go into Fable specifically, which is the technology that takes your F-sharp code and turns into JavaScript, are there any questions right now? Cool. Pretty cool, right? Especially type providers, they're, they're pretty great. So, so what is Fable? Fable is a tool very much like TypeScript, uh, where TypeScript is a language where you have a statically typed programming language that com compiles down to, to JavaScript. Well, now we can do that with F-sharp. So, what it does is it takes your F-sharp source code, not the IL that is generated, but actually the, the raw F-sharp source code files, and it generates JavaScript. To me, there are four layers of benefits to this tool. Number one, it lets you execute your idiomatic F-sharp code in the browser itself. This is great for teaching people and playing with it without having to download an environment. Next layer of benefit is that we can access the core browser functionality, such as DOM, alerts, console log, all those kind of things in F-sharp in a static way. Number three, I think the most important thing is that we can now access the whole JavaScript ecosystem in a statically typed way. I remember when Node.js came out, all the, all the people were saying, yeah, okay, we can write one language and we can do stuff on both the client side and the server side. We can use JavaScript everywhere. And for half a second, I was excited, but then I remembered it's JavaScript. Uh, but, but now, but now all the things that JavaScript can do, and that's pretty much everything I can do in a, in a type safe way. And that, I, I really love that, especially coming from a, a functional programming background. And finally, we can do full stack web development in one language with shared code. So you can have this exact same shared code, statically typed, use it on both client side and on server side. So you don't have to do things like create the same view model in C Sharp and in TypeScript, because I know that can be quite a pain. So Let's go into Fable, let's, let's use it. The easiest way to get started with Fable is to go to the website fable.io slash REPL. And a REPL is just a read, evaluate, print loop uh, program. So basically, you can imagine this is a really cheap IDE I can go to. So fable.io slash REPL. And if I type in F sharp source code on the left here, and this is a really nice environment where I can actually use uh, you know, IntelliSense and all that in my browser here. What I can do is I hit compile up here, and I can see what the corresponding JavaScript code is. So you can see that it, it takes in idiomatic F-sharp source code, and it prints out pretty nice JavaScript code. It's not something you're, you're gonna look at and, and think it's really ugly. It's, it's pretty, it's done pretty well. And if I wanna see it running, I, I could, ooh, I just broke everything, cool. The point being, I can very quickly uh, play with my normal F-sharp source code and, and see it in the browser. If I want to do some slightly, uh, look at some slightly more interesting examples, what we have here is a very small game, which is using Canvas and you know um, all the different regular browser technologies. It has a reference to some HTML document here, specifically of an element called Canvas. And if I, if I use my mouse over here, I can move this little ball around. I think I'm supposed to collect other black circles and avoid the white circles, I don't know. 
Um, point is, all this was done in a very type safe way using the whole JavaScript ecosystem. So if I want to call, if I want to add a, a key up uh, event listener, I can add an event listener very quickly uh, if, if my browser uh, decides to work with me well. All right, I have 20 things running, so it's a little bit slow right now. But point being, I can add an event listener very simply in this interactive environment of Fable REPL. Fun fact about Fable REPL, and I'll answer your question after that, Fable REPL is actually the Fable source code compiled with the Fable source code. So all the f -sharp code that compiles f -sharp to JavaScript takes itself, compiles itself down to JavaScript. So the actual Fable compiler is running in the browser right now. None of this is touching a server. I, th I think it's, it's pretty neat. Uh, you have a question? Yes. Yeah. All right. I don't know about that. Maybe they're just like. Maybe Yeah, maybe, maybe Kapersky is the wrong thing. That's interesting. It might be because the HTTPS is being weird. I'm not sure. Their, their certificates may be off. I haven't gotten viruses that I know about from it yet. Yeah, that's, that's an important bit. So the point is we can do uh, F sharp source code and, and convert it into JavaScript very quickly. And it's very clean, typically. So under the hood, how does this work? Well, typically, F sharp source code is compiled by taking that source code, uh, converting it, or taking that code, uh, getting an AST for an abstract syntax tree, which is basically a data representation of your actual source code. And it's taking that and convert it, converting it into IL, or intermediate language, the same thing that C Sharp and VB compile to. There is another tool called Babel that you might be familiar with that takes brand new, you know, all the new fancy features of JavaScript and it converts it down to older versions of JavaScript. And what it does is it takes your ES2015 or whatever it's called these days, converts it to something called a Babel AST, so some other abstract syntax tree representing the code's intentions, and it converts it down to that older JavaScript. What Fable does is it kind of just works itself in the middle there. It calls the f -sharp compiler with your f -sharp source code, gets to the point where f -sharp compiler has generated the f -sharp ASTs, takes those ASTs, outputs the Babel ASTs, and lets Babel does the rest. So it, it's pretty interesting to see how it works under the hood. So getting started, very simple. Uh, Fable is .NET Core application. I can work with it in a normal .NET Core environment. So if I, if I were to go to the console and do these quick steps, what I would get is something like this, where I have a do, 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 an application. The, the one it gives me by default is a clean little Canvas application. If I hit .NET Fable Start in my source folder here, in a second, this will load up in port 8080, and we can see it running. So what it's doing now is it's actually going to be evaluating my F-sharp source code and then outputting JavaScript, and it's going to be working together. So, so right now, it says that it's parsing my FS proj. So if I go into here, and I, if I wait a second for it to finish compiling everything, the first time it loads, it takes a minute. But then after that, it's pretty quick. But here, pretty boring example, but we can see that we can create some Canvas elements and work with the low-level uh, JavaScript APIs. Okay, so that's pretty nice and all, um, but I'm, I'm, how do we you know, work with JavaScript in F Sharp? Of course, natively, when I'm just typing in F Sharp source code, I'm not going to know about jQuery or Vue or any of these different JavaScript libraries. And there's no point of being able to compile to JavaScript if I can't use this JavaScript ecosystem. There's three main ways to be able to interact with the JavaScript ecosystem. Number one is with something called the emit attribute, which basically allows you to tell the F-sharp compiler that you know, when you call this function or you reference this type, output this JavaScript code. So right here, whenever I call the, the F-sharp function uh, select, and I provide a string to it, output this code. And if I, if I wire up some bindings manually, uh, what I can have then is F sharp source code, like we have on the right, that's written in a very you know, functional, idiomatic F sharp way, and this will output really nice, clean JavaScript. 
This is, is not the best way, I think, to, to work with most JavaScript libraries. It's going to be quite tedious, especially if you're porting a large JavaScript library and you're trying to work with an F sharp. So we have other things we can do as well. Number one is we have the import attribute. In, import attribute allows you to reference uh, custom JavaScript. So I have here a JavaScript file with two functions, parse JSON and get value, which you know one takes in one parameter, one takes in another. And if I have that file there, I can import that in my F sharp source code and define the types for it. So I, I'm bound to that. So here I have an implementation in F sharp where I'm trying to create bindings for that parse JSON function. All I have to do is say I want to import the parse JSON function from the custom.js file. And I'm going to say this is a function that takes in a string and returns an object option. Options are very similar to nullables as you're working in, in C sharp. Um, for this doesn't particularly matter, but point being, I can define those bindings. And this JS native here is basically saying, you know, I'm, I don't intend to execute this code on the server side. I only really care about what the output is on the on the JavaScript. So basically pay attention to the attributes more than you're paying attention to me. And then, you know, after I set up my bindings, I can use that code in a nice F sharp idiomatic way. Right here I have some JSON and I want to output it like that. But those two things, it, it's still kind of annoying to do. Uh, I also want to work with NPM packages. So let's say, I, say I've imported an NPF, NP package and I'm working with that. I can reference that very easily. Specifically, you know, let's say I wanted to reference the left pad NPM package, the famous one that broke the whole NPM ecosystem for a little bit. I can do that very simply. I just say import default left pad and it will automatically reference the NPM package that I have there. And so, so emit and import, those are nice, but they're still kind of painful to be dealing with all this. Uh, what I want to use instead is a tool called TS to Fable. So when TypeScript people uh, wanted to work with all of these old libraries, all these old JavaScript libraries, including jQuery and Moment and all these kind of things, they needed a way to work within a typed way. So what they did is they created something called a TypeScript definition file. TypeScript definition files are basically interfaces that host a number of different uh, interfaces and such that define, a con uh, define the semantics behind an existing library. So, so let's say I want to work with this little MIDI keyboard here, right? So if you don't know, the browser itself has a specification for working with MIDI. Uh, MIDI is a basically some kind of codified you know, se uh, signal sending thing where I can say, you know, I'm, I'm hitting this specific key at, you know, velocity 50% and I'm, I'm hitting the specific key. Uh, point being, there's a specification for this in the browser, much like there's a specification for geolocation or, or anything like that. If, if I were to look for web MIDI on the web, I could see the specification, but of course, you know, I don't want to have to be manually wiring up all those bindings in my F sharp code. Instead, what I want to do is I want to be lazy and take advantage of all the TypeScript people and use their work. So what I can do is I can basically type web MIDI TypeScript definition file, and if I type that and I Google for a little bit, I'll find something that looks like this, which is a TypeScript definition file, which basically defines a bunch of interfaces for the, the libraries or the extension points that are in that uh, JavaScript ecosystem. What I can then do is use something called TS to Fable to take that TypeScript definition file and generate F sharp source code that will automatically have bindings for me. So I don't have to do all that manually wiring up that we had a minute ago. So if I install the NPM package TS to Fable, which is naturally written in F sharp, now uh, what I can do is call it on a d.ts file and get the output um, F sharp bindings. So here I have a web MIDI d.ts. And if I call TS to Fable on it, I get the equivalent F sharp source code. And then what I can do is go into Visual Studio Code. So I've done that for web MIDI here. This is the output F sharp source code. And I've also done that for web audio, which is another specification that allows you to emit noises, you know, like different uh, waves from your computer. And in, uh, in Visual Studio Code now, I, I have referenced those two uh, imports. So here I have Fable import web MIDI, Fable import web audio, and I can use that uh, very quickly. So I'm going to 
called .NET Fable npm start. That's my normal, you know, get up and running routine. Uh, hooks into Webpack if you're familiar with that. And if if I wait just a minute here, this will come up, or it'll just break like that. Cool. Let's hope npm install doesn't go too slowly. But at, as I'm working here, uh, because I've set up all of these different uh, bindings through tsdfable, I can work with this in a very type safe way. So if I want to work at a specific oscillator and call the functions that are on that, I can do that in a very type safe way. I have a few things open, so it's taking a second here. Do, do, do. time. Oh, I know what it is, actually. I think I have two things open. Yeah. I still have something else open in that port, and that's why it was yelling at me. If you have two things open on 88, it'll start yelling. So anyway, if I run that, uh, what I've done is I have static bindings to all this, so if I want to work with the, the web MIDI and the web audio information, I can load that up into my browser, and what I've done is in F Sharp, I've written code that will can be converted to JavaScript in my browser. We'll see how loud this is in the, in the browser here. But I can work with my MIDI keyboard and, and have things output. Let's see how long this takes here. But you can see how quickly it is, how quickly it can take if you use TSDFable to create bindings for other libraries like Vue and React and all those kind of things and work with them in, in a very type safe way. So here, if, if I hit some keys on my keyboard, and if we have audio up, what was that? Yes. Here, let me, let me get a speaker in my computer here. So if I take this, it's a pretty low noise, but so all the, all the different keys I'm hitting are being taken in, all the MIDI messages I'm doing are being taken in, and I'm converting that to web audio. Uh, if you don't know about these little MIDI keyboards, it's pretty cool. You can put an arpeggiator on, so if you hold multiple keys, it'll automatically cycle between them. So it's pretty fun. Anyway, so you can do anything you can do with JavaScript with F Sharp in a very type safe way very quickly, and I, I had a lot of fun creating that little demo there. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. <laughs> we did play music. Well, this play, F sharp played music. <laughs> so, so that's Fable. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is is Elmish. So Elmish is an architecture that is commonly used in in real world, you know, production level uh, Fable applications. And in in Fable Elmish, what we have is we we've taken the ideas behind the programming language Elm which inspired many things such as React and Vue, especially libraries like Vuex and Redux and those kind of things. And we can use that in F Sharp in a, in a number of different ways. So in uh, functional reactive programming or in model view update, there's a lot of different brandings for this, you basically have three things in your application. So, so let's say we have a very simple application that's a counter. This counter is just has some counter value, which is my aggregate state. I have a few buttons, specifically an increment button, a decrement button, and a reset button, and I have that all displayed on the screen. If I want to split that up into a very concrete component level mental model, I have three things. I have one, the model itself. What, what is our aggregate state? What types does it hold? And what are the potential changes that can happen to our aggregate state? Number two is I have a view. I have, a I have some function that takes the aggregate state and outputs, in this case, HTML into my screen. And number three, I have update, which is something that takes an aggregate state, takes an intention or some kind of user interaction, and returns a new aggregate state. So let's, let's break that down a little bit. So the model in this very simple counterexample is simply an integer, very, very boring. Uh, the, the different kinds of messages or user intents that can happen are an increment, a decrement, and a reset. Of course, increment just increase the number by one, decrement down by one, and reset changes it back to zero. And finally, I have some initialization function just returns what the initial value should be, in this case, zero. In addition to having a model, 
which is the, the, the first bit of functional reactive programming. But I also have a view. A view is something that takes that model and outputs something for the user to see, whether it's through a command line or HTML or whatnot. In this case, what I have is I have a function that takes in that integer and it returns HTML. And this looks pretty foreign to a lot of you guys, but this is actually a function that returns HTML at the end of the day. Um, all the different functions, you know, called div and called span and those kind of things, those take in a model and they return two things. Number one, the attributes that that, that uh, element should have, and number two, the children that should be under that element. So uh, if I have a helper function called simple button, that div has a number of attributes that correspond to it, has a number of children that go under it specifically, uh, the buttons and that kind of thing. And you don't need to know about all the syntax at the end of the day. Uh, most important is the, the construct of, of how this uh, ecosystem works. So I have this view. And finally, I have an update function. An update function is just something that takes in the current aggregate state, takes in the intent, one of those increment, decrement, or reset intents, and it returns a new aggregate state. So I have an update function that takes in a message, that's the intent, has a model. This match, this pattern matching thing is just a, a really fancy way to do if statements, basically, or switch statements. There's, there's a lot of benefits to it. Uh, but point being, I, I take those different intents, I want to match on what the in specific intent is, I want to return a new aggregate state. Using this architecture, I can build a very component, uh, a componentized uh, web application very quickly and in a, in a very nice way. A uh, fun fact, this is actually sitting on top of React. At the end of the day, Fable Elmish uh, is sitting on top of React, and that's what's under the hood. So all the benefits and all the tooling you have for React, you can use here. So um, in React, you can use time travel debugging to kind of go back a step or two uh, in your browser. You can use those exact same tools in the browser here. So it's pretty nice. We can use Fable Elmish, which is just an implementation of this pattern, in, uh, in Fable, and we can also use it in other things. Uh, specifically, we can use Fable Elmish with React Native, which is a mobile application development framework. Uh, there's actually a good talk about this on YouTube by a guy named Stefan Forkman about how his business uses uh, F Sharp to create React Native applications. We can use it for WPF. Uh, there's good bindings for working with there. And we can also use it for Xamarin, Form specifically. So using this architecture, we can do a lot of things. It's very nice. Uh, the, the final thing I want to talk about today is the safe stack. Safe stack is just uh, basically a branding for a full stack web development F Sharp ecosystem here. So F Sharp has been on the web for quite some time. We've actually had books out about it for a while. Uh, we've had you know a number of attempts for client side web development with F Sharp. Uh, Pit, FunScript, Web Sharp are all kind of some weird names. We've had a bunch of different server side technology. It, including existing .NET technologies such as MVC or Web API, in addition to F# -sharp specific frameworks such as Swab and Freya and all these other things, we also have Canopy, which is a um, F# -sharp tool that wraps Selenium if used to automated web browser testing. So F# has been on the web for a while, but uh, a few months ago, someone decided that they wanted to do full stack web development, especially now that Fable has has really come to popularity. So they invented this, the safe stack, which has Swab, which is an F-sharp framework for uh, you know, server-side development, Microsoft Azure, F-sharp, and Elmish, Elmish being the application architecture we just saw a second ago. And point being, if I go into Visual Studio code here again, what I have is an application where I have an example of full stack uh, web development in um, in F Sharp, so made with safe stack, so it has normal uh, things like I can, you know, log in or log out. I can create a, um, you know, different wish list items, that kind of thing, and I can really use this uh, this whole application architecture to create full stack web applications where I'm using shared code on client and server. Just to prove the the bit about shared code, if I jump back here, you'll see in my project I have two folders, client and server. And in my server project, I actually have a folder of shared uh, F Sharp code. This code is referenced on the client side uh, that is compiled with Fable, and also on the server side that is used with Swab, the web framework for F Sharp. So I think it's really nice to be able to 
do this. I know back in the day, again, when, when JavaScript came out, people were really excited they could reuse their JavaScript code on the client side and the server side, but it's JavaScript. Now it doesn't have to be JavaScript, right? So, so we can do that. So that's, that's the, the safe stack, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting tool that we can use to create full stack web applications with F Sharp. So, so that's, that's the general bit of tonight. I hope you guys really enjoyed this. If you guys have questions beyond this, uh, you can always contact me for help. Beyond that, there's a lot of links here. The fsharp.org website. Uh, F Sharp for Fun and Profit's a great blog that has a lot of posts on you know, how you can use F Sharp in the enterprise and that. There's tons of action on Twitter, lots of you know, F Sharp people that use this in, in real world applications. There's a Slack channel, awesome F Sharp, I forget the link to that, I should post that. Um, and a number of other things. Again, all this is, is listed on my website, stashu.net. And uh, you know, just to conclude, are there any final questions before we head out for the night and enjoy the good weather? Cool, well, thank you all for coming. Stashu, if, uh, yep. if you don't mind, could you open a browser window? I could. And uh, just to remind people uh, that are uh, on the stream tonight, let's go to mixer.com slash philly.net. And uh, can we have a picture of Stashu showing a picture of Stashu? <laughs> oh, God. Nice. It works. <laughs> can you do recursion in F sharp? Of course you can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We just proved it. Yeah. All right, excellent. So this is uh, this is what people see in the stu in the. Uh, do we call this the studio audience or? <laughs> this is the studio audience. This is what they see out in broadcast land. And uh, so, uh, Chris, could you do a quick walkthrough what people are looking at here? Uh, Chris Gomez is uh, our uh, stream meister. Is that is that a proper term? <laughs> Cool. So if you if you were to join us on on Mixer, um, we stream the show live, and in the back we have different views where maybe we might show what's going on on the uh, on the console here with the presenter in a window, or sometimes if the presenter is is waxing eloquently, we might bring the presenter up full screen. Plus, we have the ability to to put some. Uh, bar, some, some sidebars at the bottom. It's definitely a work in progress. We get a little bit better every stream, I think. And uh, we have some some regulars who join us in the chat room. Um, and I think the most important thing is to get the word out about this. So if you know people who maybe don't live in this area, uh, we would love to burst outside of the Philly region and let people know about the great content here at philly.net, including our hands-on labs, our presentation meetings, and we will be streaming one room at Code Camp Saturday, March twenty fourth. Yeah. Did I just did I just get that correct for get imprinted on the YouTube channel? Good, because if I got that date wrong, that would be wonderful. And you can always watch every replay uh, youtube.com slash philly.net, philly d o t n e t, where not only will you get to see everything you see tonight in the comments for every replay we put up a list of links so the folks here that watched online got a roundup of links um, from onetap.com learn that trick from john galloway and the asp.net community stand up which everybody here should be watching um what else do we want to talk about with mixer uh jeff fritz who uh, lives in the philadelphia area yeah jeff fritz and the asp.net team Yeah, so, so uh, Jeff streams every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Typically lasts about two hours. Sometimes I'm in there to moderate if I can. Um, and he will he's working on some projects. So it's basically like watching some live coding and pair programming with the cloud is what he calls it. Um, but then as a reward for reaching a follower goal, uh, just this last Friday, he did an eight-hour stream with some guests like, like Julie Lerman, um, Rich Ross was a guest on the podcast recently. So, you know, anybody here with some expertise, I'm, I'm certainly all of you would be welcome to pair program with him. Uh, he's looking for guests. 
Uh, it's pretty cool to have someone from our area who's also an ASP.NET program manager streaming on Mixer. Uh, he also streams on Twitch, but you know what? I want to get the Mixer numbers up. So mixer.com slash C sharp Fritz. He multi streams to both platforms. Um, and, and again, we're going to have that talk at CodeCamp. So if any of you are interested in learning how to broadcast either at home or maybe what we do here, it's a little bit two sides of the same coin. It's not quite exactly the same to broadcast a user group as it is at home, but use a lot of the same software and a lot of the same equipment, then definitely come see that talk too. Did we hit eight o'clock? We're getting there five to five till. Turn it over to Bill. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thanks, Chris and Rich, for all the uh, work you're doing on the stream. Uh, good crowd tonight. Good turnout. Hope you, uh, you had a good time. And uh, make sure you eat all the food on the way out. We don't want to leave any uh, any bits. Uh, please clean up the room. And uh, we'll see you in exactly four weeks and two days. Is that correct? And three days. No, well, no. I'm, I'm going to be there Friday. Yeah. If you didn't pay for Friday, I mean, yeah, that's the way it is. Oh, come on. It's only 45 minutes. All right. Have a good night.